Hey church, if I haven't met you yet, my name's Leon and it is a serious joy to be worshipping God with you all today. While we aren't meeting in person together yet, God keeps reminding, reminding me of all the blessings he's giving us. We're all in our separate homes, but that does not mean that the church is hindered. We aren't in a church building, but that doesn't stop the spirit from transforming our hearts. I just love picturing everyone in their homes worshipping God together, even though we are separate. And it shows us that there are definitely blessings in this season. If you are new to church and you don't know what worshipping God means, it is so good to have you here. We want to welcome you and show you Jesus' love. Before we sing, the word in Psalm 113 proclaims the majesty of God and reminds us of our posture towards him. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Though the seasons change in our lives, our God is still worthy to be praised. He's still worthy to be praised when the sun rises all the way to when the sun sets, now and forevermore. Our God is always good and he is always worthy of our song. So if you are able, come join with us by standing and singing as we praise our God in whatever season we are in.
everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. Yes, Jesus, we believe in you, we trust you, we praise you. For you have risen again from the grave, you've conquered death, you have paid the price for our sins, you have made us children of the living God. We pray today that you would help us to fix our eyes on your goodness and bring yourself great praise and glory. And we pray this for your sake. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to church. Great to have you with us today. We're looking at Psalm 73 and we're just going to be fixing our eyes on the goodness of God. He is so good. He is so worthy of praise. If you're joining us for the first time, whether you're looking for a new church or you are exploring who Jesus is, it's great to have you here. A reminder, there is a connection card you can click on. You can share your details with us. We'd love to help you find out more about our church and help you on your journey finding out who Jesus is. Well, do you know, throughout our week, our week we have hundreds of people meeting in connect groups. Small groups, praying together, doing life together, supporting one another, feasting on God's word. 
And it's so exciting just hearing stories about connect groups that are caring for each other. I heard one story this week of connect groups that are budding up together in pairs each week and, and getting a coffee and talking about God and his work in their lives. So many stories. And even right now, watching church, there are a lot of connect groups meeting together, doing church in living rooms. It's so exciting. If you're interested in being a part of a connect group, can I encourage you, click that connection card. We'd love to help you get more involved and become one of those members of a group. Well, kids, it's time for our kids spot. Let's see what our kids team has in store. Hey, Murphy, how are you? Hi, Betsy, oh, I'm okay. I have just been sitting here thinking about how good God is. I've been reading my Bible. I was reminded of last week's sermon that God is with us. And I've just been loving the fact, thinking about how good God is. Oh, Betty, it's been so good. Last week, it was so comforting to know mm -hmm. that God, our powerful God, is with us. Mm -hmm. But, Betty, I've been feeling a bit sad because mm -hmm. all the other kids in my school, well, they have this toy and they don't trust Jesus. But I trust Jesus, but I don't have the toy. It's not fair. Oh, that doesn't sound very fair. That reminds me of a psalm that I've been reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in Psalm 73... The psalmist talks about that he knows God is good, but he looks around and he sees everyone around him and people who don't follow God. And it seems like their life is working out. And he starts to wonder if maybe it's even worth it to follow God. Oh, well, he doesn't have a toy, does he? No, he doesn't have a toy. Okay, but I, I, I feel like that too, Betsy. Yeah. Do you know him all? Yeah, so the psalmist gets confused. And then he goes to the place where God is and he remembers how good God is. Wow. And when he sits where God is and he looks at, at the presence of God, he remembers that God is good and that it's worth following him to be his friend forever. So let's look at the Bible real quick. Okay. Let me good. remind we can remember God's goodness when we look in the Bible that Jesus died on the cross for us. Yep. So that we could be friends with God and be with him forever. Wow. Well, you know. I think it's easy for us to be like the psalmist as well. I might get that toy, or maybe I won't, but it's okay. I get to be friends with Jesus now and forever in heaven. But, oh, I guess that's the sad thing for my friends. If they're not friends with Jesus, then they won't get to be in heaven with him forever. Yeah, that's a great point, Murphy. We're going to talk more about that in Kids Church, so I'll see you there, okay? Okay. Bye, Betsy. Bye, everyone. Bye, Murphy. Guys, let's pray and let's thank God for the ways that he is with us and for his goodness and to pray that our friends can know God's goodness. Dear Lord, thank you so much that you are good and that when we look and we are reminded of our goodness, we're not distracted by the people around us and that we can be your friends forever and that you are with us forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now it's time for Kids Church. So you can set your kids up to get ready. There'll be a minute countdown, or you can grab a coffee, grab your Bible, and we'll see you in a minute. Well, we're here with Karen, who is a member of our 330 congregation. Great to have you with us, Karen. Thank you. And Karen, do you want to firstly just share with us uh, the news recently? Your sister has become a Christian. Super exciting. What has that been like since that all happened? Yeah. 
Well, it has been a really interesting time. Um, Sandra um, has done Alpha recently and we did that together, which was amazing. It was, um, finally she said yes. Mm. And um, so we finished Alpha and then the week after Alpha finished, Sandra was diagnosed with cancer. And um, so that's been really hard for our family. That's been really hard for Sandra, but off the back of that, um, the day after her diagnosis, she asked the Lord into her life. And so she is choosing to trust in Jesus in this time. And God's timing is perfect. I mean, she really needs him. And, um, and so, yeah, it's been an interesting time. There's been sadness and there's been joy all at yeah, once. All at once, yeah. yeah. Well, wow. we'll be praying for Sandra at the end of this. We're talking today about Psalm 73, and it talks about how God is good and he is our portion, all that we need. You're a Christian who has same-sex attraction. Do you want to share a bit about what that's been like for you as a Christian, having mm. same-sex attraction? Mm. In regards to trusting God um, with my same-sex attraction over a long period of time, like over 30 years, um, there's been there's been challenges in my relationship with God around trust in that, does he really know what's best? Does he um, really understand um, what he's asking me to do in relation to be being single and celibate um, for, the, for, for, for my life? And, um, and there's been times, you know, I've never doubted that God is good and that his word is true on the area of homosexuality. Um, I've, but living out, I guess, that truth um, at different seasons has been really challenging, um, primarily through, um, I guess, the, str the struggle of loneliness that I've felt in that journey with God and trusting in my times of loneliness um, God, um, where are you? Um, is this really your best for me? Um, you know, I had feelings of feeling really ripped off relationally, feeling like, God, um, you know, I long for intimacy. I long for companionship. I long to share um, my life with someone like most people do um, and come trying to reconcile those feelings and thoughts um, and align them and be aligned with God's word has has been um, conflictual mm -hmm. at times. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, trusting trusting him in those times of real loneliness, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, has sometimes, the, my loneliness has sometimes got the better of me. Right. So how did you get to the point where you trusted God and you enjoyed his goodness throughout all this? Yeah. Look, over the 30 years, you know, there's been different seasons um, it, as there is with anyone's journey. Um, I basically, you know, at times in my relationship with God have thought my way is best mm. and I've chosen to live my life in ways that haven't been his best. Um, Which we all have, haven't we? I mean, yeah. not trusted God and gone our own way. Yeah, yeah. And, and also in terms of the loneliness, really looked for ways or ran to things or people or relationships or friendships or busyness with, um, you know, activities, um, busying up my life um, to fill the, the emptiness and the void of that loneliness and coming to realise, coming to realise um, that no one or no thing um, it will fill, fulfill you or satisfy you and like God will mm. and like God can. Mm. And so I've come, he's given me this amazing, amazing insight, spiritual insight and revelation that really, truly he is enough. Mm. And I always say, and I know now through lived experience that trust and peace go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Trusting God and peace from God go hand in hand. And the peace 
that I have now and live with now through absolutely trusting that God's way is best mm. is has been incredible. The mm. peace that I have, it's undescribable. Yeah. It's hard to describe the peace that I have mm. um, with God. There's just nothing that tastes better mm. than living God's way and doing life his way. Karen, the church is really helpful in your life. Do you want to share a bit about what church family has meant for you? It's, it's meant a lot to me. Um, you can't flourish as a Christian in isolation from other believers. And so I've so valued um, my Christian friendships. Um, I valued where we pray together, where we confess our sins together, where we're vulnerable and honest with each other. Um, it's been amazing. And I really like the Proverb 27, 17, where it says, iron sharpens iron as one person sharpens another. Yeah. And I love that. Well, we are so encouraged by you, Karen, and so thankful that you've shared your story so honestly. We'd love to pray for you. So let's pray together and thank God for Karen. Father, we thank you for your goodness in Karen's life. We thank you for her sister, that you have saved her, that she is trusting you. And we pray through this great trial that she is in right now, that you would strengthen her and grow her through it. And Lord, we pray for Karen. We thank you, Lord, that she is walking with you and for you. Lord, we pray that she would keep running the race, keep living in obedience to your word, keep pursuing you and your goodness, and keep reminding herself that you are all she needs. Father, we pray that she would encourage others with her story. And we thank you for her boldness in sharing. And Lord, as we prepare now to hear from your word, to hear it read, to hear it preached into our hearts, Lord, would you help us to not just listen and forget, but listen and put it into practice. Would you speak to us, Lord? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, I'm Alison. I'm reading Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I'd nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? This is what the wicked are like, always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you place them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 
Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God is good. God is always good. We believe that, don't we? That our God is a good God. But what about those times when he just isn't good? Is God good when the persecuted pastors we support in northern Vietnam through Voice of the Martyrs, when they're imprisoned hundreds of miles from their families, as the authorities that imprison them sit at dinner tables surrounded by loving family? Is God good when our children's pastor, Naomi DeVries, has her identity stolen and her bank account emptied by a fraudster? Is God good when you are single because of your refusal to marry someone who doesn't share your faith and you just feel like you spend all of your life celebrating other people's happiness? Is God good when those who deny his existence and write books about it make millions of dollars from their sales? Is God good when this life just seems to reward those who ignore him and you and I who live to please him just feel like life is every day an uphill battle? These are the questions that Psalm 73 gives us permission to explore. This psalm is not a psalm about why do the godly suffer. It's a psalm about why do the godless prosper. We're going to be answering questions like, is it really worth living God's way in God's world? And how do we hold on to the goodness of God in a world that seems to reward those who don't? You will have noticed as you read in your Bible that Psalm 73 comes at the beginning of book three of our collection of Psalms. If books one and two were about God's king and life in God's land, well, book three is about exile, life in a foreign land, about the times when the godless prosper, when the wicked triumph, the times when God seems distant or, or even to have disappeared. This Psalm was written by Asaph, Asaph was the Curtis Smith of King David's Israel in 1000 BC. He was the lead worship pastor of God's people. And here he shares with us a moment of honest spiritual stumbling. The beautiful thing about this psalm is that it teaches us what true faith is like. True faith is not an absence of doubt. True faith is bringing the doubts we have into the presence of of God. The big idea of Psalm 73 is to keep our eyes fixed on the goodness of God. But the way we're going to do it is by following Asaph on this journey of losing sight of the goodness of God and see what God has to teach us from it. So let's begin with our first point, doubting the goodness of God. Verse 1, surely God is good to Israel. Good to those who are God's, not just by name, but God's people by nature, pure in heart. Asaph knew that with his head. He could articulate it with his mouth. But he wasn't experiencing it in his life. As for me, he says, verse 2, my feet had almost slipped. For I'd taken my eyes off God and I was looking around at the prosperity of the wicked and I envied them. You know, it's been said there are two types of Christians. Those who have envied the ungodly and those who haven't but are lying. We've all felt what Asaph felt here. And who wouldn't? For look, at the, look at the ease with which the ungodly prosper in this life. There's the peace of the ungodly. Verse 3, they, they are prosperous. They have no struggles. Verse 4, they're free from common ills that seem to plague the rest of humanity and us. There's the power of the ungodly. Verse 6, therefore they become proud and they find ways of ruthlessly getting what they want and keeping what they get. Have you ever noticed that those who have experienced great success in the world have an amazing way of getting what they want and getting others out of the way? There's the pride of the ungodly. 
Therefore their mouths sprout loud boasts. Verse 9, their mouths they claim to heaven, their tongues take possession of the earth. And all the while, it just seems like God is out to lunch. The light's on, but no one's home. Does the Most High even know, they ask, in verse 11? And lastly, there's the popularity of the ungodly. Therefore, these people, they gather a following. These are the ones who sell out their books, fill up the stadiums, are the most listened to podcasts, get the most followers on social media. These are the ones who gather a crowd around them. But it's not just the ungodly who gather around them. No, verse 10 reads literally, therefore his, that is God's people, turn to them and drink up their waters in abundance. They're even drawing the godly away from God. So who are they for you? Who are the people in your life who you look at and think, I would be happy if only my life was more like Or if only I could have it all like we've all got them. So name them before God. Bring them into his presence. Doubting the goodness of God comes not only as we observe the prosperity of the ungodly, but also as we experience the struggles of the godly. Asaph turns his eyes to his own life and he asks himself the question in verse 13. Is all this in vain? Have I just kept my hands pure in innocence for nothing? What's the point of being holy, he asks, when it's paying down in affliction? Every day I wake up and I just feel like I'm getting slapped in the face and maybe that's what it's been like for you. You spend your life trying to serve God, love God's people, live God's way and it's just hard. You're leading a connect group and and your connect group makes life harder. You're laying yourself down in ministry and all you're getting back is struggles and hardship. I remember when I worked as a chaplain, uh, there was a young rugby player by the name of Michael. He was an outstanding athlete for his age. He was in the top rugby team and he was a Christian. Michael uh, played well. He was good, fit, fast. His mates would go out on the weekend and they would get up to no good and Michael would go to church on the weekend and serve in the band. And when it came time to who got the lucky breaks, who would move forward? The ungodly. And Michael would get the injury. Michael would just miss out. It just seemed so unfair. I remember reading Psalm 73 with him to try and make sense because sometimes in times of life, just like his, the grass does seem so much greener on the other side. So let me ask you, why do you think life is so good for the godless? and can be so hard for those who love God. Well, Jesus explained it to us like this. He said, this world is a little bit like a house party that got out of control in a vineyard. The tenants had taken over and they began to rule the place like like they owned it. They did with whatever they wanted, with whomever they wanted, whenever they wanted. And when the owner would send messengers, or even when he sent his son, They would ignore the messages and they even killed the son. And that son is Jesus. Jesus is that son and his life is the clearest demonstration you could get that life in God's world doesn't go good for God's people all the time. No one lived more perfectly, more pure of heart than Jesus Christ. But he was born into obscurity. He grew up as a refugee in exile in in Egypt, running away, fleeing for his life. He moved to Nazareth, Nowheresville, the armpit of Israel, and grew up as a chippy. The Bible says that his life was a life that was full of struggles. He was familiar with grief and pain, a man of sorrows. The Bible describes him as as having had a, a difficult and challenging life all the way. And how did that life end? Penniless and naked, hung up on a Roman cross to die. This was the experience of God in the flesh, God with us. Why did the ungodly prosper? Jesus felt that. Why did the godly suffer? Jesus felt that. And I don't want you to remove the humanity from Jesus. He really felt 
the pangs of injustice in this world. But he put up with it because he knew where, where, where things would end up. It wasn't the path that we take to get there, but where life ends that matters. And that's our second point, understanding eternal destinies. When you bring eternity into the picture, everything looks different. Asaph discovered this when he entered into God's presence in verse 17. When I tried to understand all this, he says, it troubled me deeply until I entered into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. And listen to the words that the psalmist goes on to describe the destiny of the ungodly. Slippery ground, ruin, destruction, terror, as fleeting as a dream, despised as a fantasy. Everything comes to light as Asaph enters into the presence of God. For him, the presence of God was a tabernacle. For us, it is Jesus. When we come into the presence of God, our vision is reshaped. Our, our, our understanding of the world is reframed and we see life in light of eternity. Remember what Jesus told us at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? He said, Wide is the gate and broad the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But narrow the gate and difficult the path that leads to life and only a few find it. Jesus says, Eternity changes everything. Everything looks different in light of the end destiny where we head to. Friends, no one envies a life that ends up in hell. For those of us who remember him, no one envies the life of Christopher Scase, Australia's greatest uh, fugitive businessman. Uh, we all know how his life ended up running from the law on a ventilator in Mallorca in Spain. So no one then, knowing that's their destiny, looks back on his life and thinks, oh, I wish I could have been at one of Christopher Scase's fancy dinner parties, stayed with him in one of his brilliant resorts or had shares in his failed business. No, we know the destiny. And so we don't envy the path he took to get there. The same is true with the lives of the ungodly that we find ourselves envying. Their lives and the pleasures that they enjoy are as real and as permanent as a bad dream from which we're soon to awake. And we need to remember this important thing about envy. With envy, our creative minds fill the gap. So you see an impressive looking car driving down the road and your mind presumes that that car is driving home to a happy home where they'll be met by a loving family and a caring wife. Or you see that picture of a pretty girl and you imagine that that girl is beautifully satisfied with her life, has a deep sense of inner worth and self-contentment. The reality is much more like my conversation with our sister Sue Bennett, where she just said, I just feel sorry for them, Ed. We get to walk through life held by the everlasting love of God and they just don't know what they're missing out on. And that's our third point. Enjoying the goodness of God. It is better by far to be near God, friends. Better by far to be near the good God. So how do we keep our eyes from drifting down to the temporary treasures of this world and lift them up to the good eternal blessings of the goodness of God? Well, let me first tell you about what became a a favourite family adventure for the Yorston family during isolation. Uh, let's go for a family walk, says cruel and uh, tyrannical father to his children as he walks into the TV room. Ah, oh, Dad, why? Why do we have to do exercise? Everyone else gets to stay at home and play on their devices. But I know what's best for my kids, and so I show the meanness of my soul as I walk around and snatch devices off them and turn off all the screens. And then out we go for our walk. I hold fast to their hands as we cross busy roads on our way down to Mossman Bay. As I lead them into the bush, I direct them, I guide them on the right paths to take. I instruct them on which rocks not to step on because they're slippery. 
And after an exciting journey through the bush and a few wet sneakers and a few scuffed knees, we end at our destination, Mossman Bay Waterfall. Who would have known that Mossman had a waterfall? I, I certainly wouldn't if it wasn't for isolation. But friends, verse 23 and 24 teach us how to enjoy the goodness of God. Let me explain. Verse 23 Yet I am always with you, says God. God as a loving, present, heavenly father can handle our spiritual hissy fits like Asaph had. He can handle us voicing our frustrations towards him because he knows that he's good and he knows that he has our best interests in mind. And so he will persist in bringing about his good purposes, whether we like it or not. We can know that God is committed to our good even when we've not been committed to him and that is a great comfort. Verse 23, you hold me by my right hand. To protect us on the busy parts, paths of life, God holds us in his hand. When life gets scary, God holds you in his hand. When you have to navigate tricky or treacherous parts of your journey, God holds you in his hand. I've always liked to think of God's hold on us being more like a monkey grip. What matters is not the strength of our grip, but that God never lets go. Verse 24, you guide us with your counsel. When God says in his word, don't step on that mossy rock, it's not because he wants to ruin your fun. It's because he loves you and wants to protect you and knows what's best. Uh, when God says, take this path, it's not because he wants you to be different from the people around you. It's that he knows the destiny that he's directing you towards. And so he wants to do what is best for you. Even if you really struggle to trust the goodness of his word, I promise you, it will come through and it will be for your good. Verse 24, and afterward you will take me into glory. The glorious destination of your journey with God is not the somewhat underwhelming sights of Mossman Waterfall. It is the glorious, everlasting pleasures of eternity in heaven with him. There is nothing better, nothing bigger, nothing longer lasting, more glorious, more hopeful, more full of life than to finally end up with the good, good God. It doesn't matter if you get there with some wet shoes and scratched knees. What matters is that you arrive and this eternity will change everything about how you view what's really good in this life. So we say with the psalmist, there is nothing better than being near God. The mouths of the wicked, will they lay claim to heaven. But our God is the God who rules heaven. The mouths of the ungodly, they, they boast on the earth and they seem to reign, rule and, and run around unrestrained on the earth. But our God is the king of the earth and all things belong to him. So you can, can you make the words of verse 25 your own words? Let me read them. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. When you realize how temporary the treasures of this life are, how fickle the fortunes of the wicked, there is nothing, there is really nothing better, nothing that lasts longer, nothing that will endure forever and ever than being in the presence and relationship with the ever-living, ever-loving, good, good God. Our flesh and our hearts may fail, so make God the strength of your heart. God is a rock, a safe place, a fortress. If the, the, the lives of the ungodly were on slippery slopes that led down to destruction, then a life built on God is a life built on a solid rock that will rise into eternity and be established forever and ever. So friends, make God your portion. There is nothing as good as being near our good, good God. Maybe for you, you haven't yet discovered what it's like to be in relationship with the good God. Maybe you've never taken that step of entrusting your life over to him. 
uh, then we want to give you the opportunity today to draw near to God, to come to him and, and say, I want to be near you, God. I want to change the path of my eternal destiny and I want to enjoy you forever and ever. If that's what you would like to do today, it's a very simple thing to do. Maybe you've been watching online church since, since it all began, but you've never yet taken that step of entrusting your life to Jesus. All you need to do is pray a very simple prayer. You need to say sorry to God. Sorry for living an ungodly life, for rejecting you in my life. Thank you. Thank you that Jesus died in my place taking away all my punishment and wrongdoing. And please forgive me. Help me to live from this day forward with Jesus as Saviour and Lord. If you want to do that today, then I'm going to pray a prayer that you can echo in your hearts to God. If this is the first time you've ever done that or the first time in a long time that you want to return to God and draw near to Him, then echo this prayer in your heart to God as we pray. Dear God, I am sorry for rejecting you in my life. I'm sorry for living like the ungodly. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross in my place, taking all my punishment for all my sin. Please forgive me. Take hold of my life and help me to live from this day forward with Jesus as my Saviour and my Lord. Amen. If you've just prayed that prayer to God today, then you have shifted the eternity of your destiny. Friends, you have gone from death to life, from hopelessness to hope, from darkness to light, and we want to celebrate with you. True faith is a faith that is open and shared with others. As the psalmist finishes, he says, because I've tasted your goodness, I'll tell of your works. So we would love you to tell someone. Uh, myself and, and Andrew, we are here to, to celebrate with you, to pray with you, to talk with you about this new journey. What we'd love you to do is click on that little connection button on, on the uh, chat function. Click there and it'll send you through, and we would love to help you in this new journey. God is good to Israel. Surely God is good. Good to those who draw near to him. Friends, if you have just drawn near to God, we can't wait to connect with you now. Paul says in Titus 2, that the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness, but to live self-controlled and upright lives while we wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You see, what we hope in shapes our desires and our loves and our priorities. We're going to sing a song now that's new to our church. Um, and I, I really love verse one of this song. It says that as we turn our eyes upon Jesus, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So let me encourage you to sing loudly, um, even while you're still trying to pick it up. Let's behold the glory and grace of Jesus together now. Things are 
Well, thanks again for joining us at church today. If you are one of those people who made a decision to become a Christian, to give your life to Jesus, that is such great news. Can I just encourage you, if you haven't yet, to click that link in the chat. Ed and myself, we're waiting there to pray with you, to encourage you and to help you take those first steps as a Christian. Same if you're someone who hasn't yet made that decision, but you want to find out more about Jesus, we're there and would love to help you do that. Well, let's pray. Let's thank God for his goodness and head out into our weeks. Please pray with me. Lord God, you are so good. We praise you. We thank you for making us, for saving us, for calling us to be your children. And we pray this week that you'd make us more like Jesus, that we'd honour you in all that we do. Lord, go before us this week and use us to love you and to love all people. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week, church.